Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we ask you for your help to help me to share this lesson on Revelation today uh, to each and every one that will be either watching it by way of Facebook or however way that they'll be viewing it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 9, we have the uh, sounding of the uh, trumpets, the angels sounding the trumpets. Chapter 10 was a brief uh, interruption to explain uh, things that are happening during this three and a half year tribulation period, the first half of the tribulation period. We're now at the midway point. Chapter 11 is also an interruption. Uh, chapter 11 is the uh, small parenthesis that begins in chapter uh, 10 and verse 1. It continues to uh, verse 14. Chapter 11 has to do with the spiritual life of Israel. Chapter 12 concerns the coming persecution of Israel. In this chapter, we find that Israel goes back to the Old Testament form of worship. They rebuild the temple. They have rejected the Messiah. They, have no, they do not believe that he has, he has come. They are still expecting him. And since they believe he did not come, they will construct this temple that uh, is referred to as a temple of rejection. Uh, then there'll be... Uh, in this chapter also, we have the revelation of two supernatural witnesses that will be recalled from the Old Testament days, and they will convey God's message in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, also, we have the 144,000 that we uh, heard of in chapter 7. Uh, they are witnesses to those on the earth, uh, all over the earth. But uh, chapter uh, 11 has to do with the two witnesses that will be testifying in Jerusalem. So we'll begin with, uh, with uh, follow with me as we begin in chapter 11 uh, and in verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot, underfoot for forty and two months. And the forty-two months, of course, is uh, equivalent to the three and a half years. In a bit of chronology, we're going to just look at some of the events that, that's going to take place. Maybe perhaps we need to have a little bit of a review. Uh, the first act starts the tribulation period by the signing of the covenant with the Antichrist. Of course, that's uh, Daniel 9 and 27. We know this is an ungodly league with, uh, with an evil power. Israel at the beginning of the tribulation uh, will not be Christian. The 144,000 servants of the Lord will go forth and they will witness. And they will reach a multitude of Gentiles that no man can number. And they, and they represent the remnant, but not the major portion of the Jewish nation. And the Jews will make this ungodly league with the Antichrist, and it will permit them to take the city of Jerusalem from the hands of the Arabs, and they will build the temple. And this, of course, will occur at the beginning of the tribulation period, as I referred to as the temple of rejection, because they have rejected Christ, and believing that he's not, the Messiah has not come. John was told to measure the temple, and the fact that he was told to measure it, it would be woefully inadequate in comparison to the other temples. The other temples were inspired by God. Of course, the measurements would, would, would certainly provide for that, but since this is inspire, inspiration by men, uh, he's told to measure it to show the inadequacy of this temple. Solomon's temple was inspired of God, and so God causes uh, John to measure this uh, mere temple built at the beginning of the tribulation period. In chapter 13 and 2, the Antichrist breaks his league with the Jews. He sets up his idol in the midst of the temple. The outer court was to be unmeasured because it was uh, given to the Gentiles. We have two periods of time that are measured here, 42 months. 1260 days, you'll see that they are exactly identical in time. They refer to that equal division of the tribulation period, and I believe it's uh, referring to the beginning of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, that the witnesses 
the 144 will be witnessing as well as the introduction of these two witnesses. Now looking at verse 3 of chapter 11, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. The 1260 days, of course, is the identical time period to the three and a half years. We see there they're very dynamic. They come upon the scene as special witnesses of God. In our King James Version, it tells us that God will give them power onto them. In Revelation 3, we see here these two witnesses have the power to send out fire from their mouths and kill those who try to persecute them. They have the power to shut up the heavens that it will rain not. The earth will be covered with great drought. At this particular time, they also have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all manner of plagues. And this is for the purpose of the witnessing of the power of God. It will be in direct contradiction to the power of the Antichrist. So who are these two witnesses? That's been speculation for, for quite some time. Um, I'm going to give you a few uh, of the uh, commentaries of who they think that they are and, and who they reason why they think they would not be the ones. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, we read, it's there predicted that Elijah would come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And in addition, we find that the use of the fire in the Old Testament was limited to, to Elijah, who called down fire to consume the altars in the days of Ahab, 2 Kings chapter 21. He was also the prophet that withheld rain from the earth for three years. So it seems more than likely that Elijah will be one of those two witnesses. We do not find that John the Baptist demonstrated that power of Elijah. He freely admitted he was not Elijah. He and the angel Gabriel made that clear in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. Gabriel told Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, that John would come in the spirit and power of Elijah does not mean that he would be Elijah. John was asked by the priests and Levites of his day in John chapter 121 from Jerusalem, and they asked him, art thou Elijah? He said, I am not. John wore sackcloth and was a type of Elijah, but he did not minister to the Jewish nation as Elijah did. And then there's only two good reasons for suggesting that Enoch was, could possibly be one. First, Enoch did not die. In Hebrews 9.27, it says, we're appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And then in Jude 14 and 15, it also indicates that Enoch was a prophet who foresaw what the, that the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all. One of the other reasons that Enoch probably will not be one of these prophets is that he was a Gentile. He lived hundreds of years before Abraham. He's not identified in any way with Israel. Enoch and Elijah never died. Is certainly not su sufficient evidence to suggest that they will be the two. For remember that all believers living at the time of the rapture of the church will be exceptions to Hebrews 9, 27. When the Lord comes, 1 Corinthians 15 chapter states that we shall be raised incorruptible. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 points out that we will be snatched and taken up to be with the Lord without ever tasting of death. So we can see that this would not certainly be evidence enough for Enoch. So we're going to present three good reasons why Moses would be the second choice. In Matthew 17 verses 1 through 5, the Lord Jesus was transfigured before his Jewish witnesses, Peter, James, and John, as you remember. The two representatives of the entire Old Testament were brought before their view. These men were Moses and Elijah. Moses manifested power to bring plagues on the earth. He turned water into blood during the days of Pharaoh. E Elijah did not do these things, but he had power to call down fire from heaven and to stop rain. So we're going to assume that these two men would be certainly given the miraculous powers which they have already demonstrated on earth, on earth previously. And thirdly, Moses is an integral part of the Jewish family tradition. So it would seem logical that he'd become one of those witnesses. Moses and Elijah combined 
represent the entire Old Testament to the Jewish nation. When the rich man asked Abraham in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, to send Lazarus back to his father's house to warn his five brethren to repent, lest they would also come to this awful place, Abraham embraced the Jewish concept of the entire Old Testament by saying, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And so we see here that Moses represents the first five books of the Bible, and Elijah represents the prophetic books. So these two men in Jewish history would both speak of God's dealing with the nation of Israel. Certainly, it would be Moses and Elijah. So that would be a good uh, uh, argument for these two being those prophets. They will be witnesses of God. They are seen as the likened unto the two lampstands and the two olive trees in the book of Zechariah. This Old Testament symbol is used to convey the message of two men proclaiming God's faithfulness, and so we can assume that Elijah and Moses will do the same. They'll be on the scene for the first half of the tribulation period to counteract those lying wonders of the Antichrist. They are told to prophesy, and indeed they will. They will preach concerning those things which are to come. And so the special witnesses of God uh, to the Holy Lamb would be Moses and Elijah, and the 144 would be the witnesses throughout the earth. And so then that brings us to verse uh, 7. When they shall have finished their testimony, of course it's referring to the uh, two witnesses, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Revelation chapter 11, verse 7. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit refers to that beast that is described in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7, which we'll be getting there uh, soon. The beast is mentioned here for the first time in verse 7. The fact that he comes up out of the abyss is a reference to the death and resurrection of the Antichrist, as we will see more in detail when we get to chapter 13. The beast or the Antichrist or the man of sin that he's also referred to as, he hates these two witnesses. He makes war against them and he kills them. But we should make a note that he, is no, he has no power over them until they have finished their testimony. They are immortal until their work is done, which certainly could be said of all God's servants who walk in obedience to him. The completely degenerate, inhuman people that live during the tribulation can be seen in Revelation, verse 8, which tells us that the bodies of the two witnesses are left open in the streets of Jerusalem, in that holy city. They are left there to lay for three and a half days. It's interesting to me that it's three and a half days. I think it, it has reference to the three and a half years that they will be allowed to prophesy. But they will be left on the streets for three and a half days. And it says in verse 9, And they of the peoples, kindreds, and tongues, and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not permit their dead bodies to be put in graves. So how will everybody be able to see these dead bodies lying in Jerusalem? Well, we know that we can see them by television. Television makes that fulfillment of revelation possible. The only way in which people all over the world would be able to see these bodies lying in the streets of Jerusalem. We have a place, uh, uh, a, a television called Telstar, that in many parts of the world, you can view the same thing at the same time. So we certainly are living at a time when this is possible. At no other time was it possible until now. So we know that this time is at hand. The witnesses are resurrected, in verses 11 and 12. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them who saw them. And they heard, come up here. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. So here we see that God is resurrecting these witnesses and bringing them back to heaven. And then the next verse, verse 13, and the same hour, we see God's judgment on Jerusalem. 
And the same hour was there a great earthquake. The tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. And the remnant were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Here we can see this cataclysmic judgment of God upon the city of Jerusalem. It certainly triggers a revival that will sweep across Israel during the second half of tribulation period. The remnant that's referred to here is the Jewish inhabitants of the city who probably after seeing the judging hand of God slay 7,000 of their residents and destroys a tenth part of their city, they will turn in faith and embrace the message of the two witnesses that have been recently resurrected. And all these events take place before the third woe is sounded in verse 14. And it identifies these two witnesses who live, they preach, they die, and are resurrected during the first half of the tribulation period. And so it sets the stage for the events of the latter half of the tribulation period. The sending of these two witnesses is just one more of those many efforts of a loving God to bring men to repentance. Many in that day will still reject them, just as many as have rejected Christ today. How is it with you? Have you received the gift of God, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? Revelation chapter 11. 15 through 19, the blowing of the seventh trumpet. It is the third woe. It does not initiate anything on the earth. Instead, it is much like the breaking of the seventh seal, Revelation 8.1, where it introduces the next series of judgments, which is the seven vials. So in order for us to comprehend this, we need to understand that immediately after this heavenly introduction to the seven vials, there's another interruption that's going to share with us what is going to happen or what is going on during this tribulation period. And that time period takes us from Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 1 to chapters uh, to 15, verse 4. And then during this, during this particular time, we see that the, we have the persecution of God's people in chapter 12. We see the Antichrist or the beast that came up out of the sea and the false prophet in chapter 13. We have the heavenly vision of chapter 14, the introduction of the last half of the tribulation in chapter 15. This is the heavenly setting that's announcing the great events that will come upon the earth, awesome beyond description, and it is referred to as the great tribulation period, the second half of the tribulation, the great tribulation. And then we have in verse 15, the first angelic chorus, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. John hears these great voices singing in heaven. Obviously, these these angelic voices are in chorus, and they announce these two things. Number one, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus and his Christ. In the King James, we see there that these kingdoms are in plural, but in the American standard, uh, which is a better translation, we see them as singular. John has viewed the kingdom of the Antichrist as a time of the glorious appearing which we'll see in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. Thus the angels announce in heaven at the very beginning of the last half of the tribulation period that the one world kingdom of the Antichrist will be conquered by the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Secondly, he shall reign forever and ever. In the Greek, this is the strongest term that could possibly be used, meaning for the ages of ages. Once Christ comes to earth, there'll be no more interruptions of his government. Rebellion will break out at the end of the millennial reign when Satan is loose just for a season. But our glorified Lord will stop it so quickly it will not interfere with his kingdom. And that brings us to the next verse, verse 16, the song of the 24 elders. And the four and twenty elders who sat before God on their thrones fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, 
who art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee the great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them who destroy the earth. Verses 16, 17, and 18. So we see here, these representatives, the four and 20 elders, fall on their faces before God, and they worship him. And they announce his eternal words, who art, was, and art to come. It's a song of thanksgiving. We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And then comes this prophetic utterance that brings the final stage of God's activity upon the earth before the coming of Christ. The 24 elders then proceed to make three predictions on the basis of the coming of Christ. Number one, the nations were angry. Thy wrath is come. It indicates that his coming, the nations will resent his coming and they will rebel against him. If you want to read more about this, you can read Psalms chapter 2. Then we have a look at verse 18, and the time of the dead that they should be judged refers to the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints who have been slain. It does not refer to the unbelievers who will be judged a thousand years later at the end of the millennium in Revelation chapter 20. The Old Testament saints' resurrection and the tribulation saints' rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation, which is also our Lord's glorious appearing. And then I'd like to read Psalms chapter 50, verses 1 through 6, that has reference to this period of time. The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty. God has, has shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous around him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Here the Lord is seen, not in heaven, but he is in the air. He is calling to his Old Testament saints who are still in heaven. You see, the church is not in heaven at this point, since we read that they were caught up to meet the Lord in the air in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which occurred before the tribulation. This is a call for the Old Testament saints who are still in heaven to be joined with those tribulation saints in the rapture and resurrection as our Lord himself has a shout for the church at the beginning of the tribulation time. He has a cry for the Old Testament saints who are resurrected and the tribulation saints that are raptured. Gather my saints together unto me. Also in verse 18, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. It, sa it says here, he will take the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet alive and throw them into the lake of fire. Their followers also will be killed, Revelation 19, 20. This uh, text also teaches that the Antichrist followers, like human beings, will die without Christ. They will go soul and spirit into that place of torment, as did the rich man did in, in Luke 16, until that great white throne judgment when they will appear for the final judgment and they will be cast into the lake of fire. Going on to verse 19, you're still with me in chapter 11. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant. There were lightnings, voices, thunderclaps, an earthquake, and great hail. Here we see that this is a passage that has to do with the rapture of Israel and the tribulation saints that are redeemed because they have entered into that covenant with him by sacrifice. The church does not have a temple or a tabernacle, but Israel did. The vision of the Ark of the Covenant it should, is a reminder to Israel that they are dealing with a covenant-keeping God, and on that basis of his past faithfulness, their redemption is guaranteed. Israel Christians and tribulation saints will share in this uh, common essential. They have entered into a covenant with God by sacrifice, the covenant of a blood sacrifice. Israel is temporarily by animal sacrifice until Jesus comes and finalizes 
all the previous sacrifices, Christians and tribulation saints, through the Lord Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself once and for all. The lightnings, the voices, the thunderclaps, the earthquake, the great hail, it indicates this scene in heaven is over and the events are about to be disclosed and have to do with the affairs of men. These catastrophes will speak the amounting of confusion and the terror that will come upon the earth in, this, in the second half of the tribulation period in view of this destruction that awaits the earth. Any intelligent being is left with only one decision, and that is to avoid that awful period in the world's future through receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord by personal invitation. And with that, I'm going to stop there. We'll, we'll pick up chapter 12 uh, next time we convene. Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity we had today to share your word, and we pray that everyone that will view this CD or listen to it in any way, that, they will, that you will speak to their hearts and they will see the urgency of the hour. If you're here among those that are listening and you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do so now. Take the opportunity to ask him to forgive you of your sins and invite him to come and live in your heart. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. Lord bless you. And by the way, Merry Christmas to you all and have a safe and wonderful time with your family and your loved ones. Lord bless.